Well, it's good to be back here uh, this morning. Uh, my wife and I were here a year ago, about March, and uh, I've had a few people that remember that I, I was not on my uh, top game. Uh, I had just gotten back from Ukraine uh, teaching the book of Ezekiel in a Bible college there, and uh, still had a little bit of jet lag going and some other stuff going, but um, I'm going to try to do better this morning, all right? You can make the judgment if you remember. There's not very many people who remembered, and that's okay. Uh, I'm used to that. But uh, we're glad to be back here this morning. Speaking of Ukraine, you know what's going on. In fact, I was supposed to have gone back the first week of March to teach in another campus the book of Ezekiel. Um, I didn't go, and, and uh, I'm glad I didn't because uh, I would have been right in the middle of a war. Uh, so let's continue to pray for Ukraine. We have two projects, MANA does, MANA Worldwide has two projects in Ukraine. The personnel and the kids that we're helping, uh, they've all uh, made their way to Romania. Uh, in fact, many of the guys that I work with, the pastors that I work with, some of them have also gone, most of them have gone to Poland. Uh, and uh, it took about two weeks for our folks uh, and the kids that they help out to make it to Romania. And they're staying along with, I think, about 40 families in the two projects that we have in Romania. And it's amazing what God, you know, God, God knows everything. God's not surprised at any of this that's going on. But uh, in fact, when I joined MAN about six years ago, we had purchased a, um, a, a, a little little clinic building, a building that had been built for a, a, a hospital or, or a clinic. And we, they built it and then decided that it was going to cost them, the organization, too much to run it. So we found out about it. We had a ministry there among the gypsies that were in the area. We found out about it and we purchased it but haven't done a lot to it since then. And a lot of, there's a lot of things that go on into that. Whenever you get into the medical field, you know, that, that becomes a little bit uh, iffy with working with the government and, and all of that. But it's, it's pretty good size, and it had a lot of room. And guess what? We have filled it now with refugees from Ukraine. And God knew. God knew that there was going to be a need, uh, and uh, the government has given MANA uh, in Romania uh, the status to be able to do that uh, in the two places that uh, we have. Our leadership was over there uh, a couple of weeks ago and, and, and uh, checked everything out. That's going to be a long-term issue. Uh, we've been raising money for that as well. Because it's going to be a while before those folks are able to come home, uh, go home, I should say. So pray for Ukraine, pray for the believers there. Um, you know, for over 50 years, they were under the thumb of the Soviet Union. And, uh, and, and so they, uh, this is a long-term thing that they've been dealing with. And I'm sure, especially for the older generations, this has brought back a lot of uh, bad memories for them. Um, I was teaching the book of Ezekiel, and, the, and if you know anything about, if you've ever read the book of Ezekiel, not very many people get past the first chapter, um, but, uh, and if you've never read it this afternoon, just try to read the first chapter and you'll understand why I said that. But in there, there's a lot, it's, it's about judgment. It's about God's judgment on the nation of Israel, God's people, for their unbelief and their uh, unwillingness to follow his word and follow his will. And, and in that judgment, there's a lot of uh, starvation. There's a lot of a lack of food, uh, uh, droughts. And to the point where they are um, eating each other. Cannibalism. It's in there. So I was teaching that and talking about that. And I said, I made the statement we don't understand that kind of famine or that kind of starvation. And we here, we don't. But one of the guys that I, that we had about 30 students, and one of the men who spoke English, he was a lawyer, is a lawyer, 
spoke to him and he said, you don't, under, you don't know Ukrainian history. And I said, you're right. What are you talking about? And he said that there was a point where the Ukrainians rose up against the Soviet Union and i.e. the Russia and tried to separate from them. And Russia squelched it. And then they went in through the, through the country and took all of the food. They would literally go into the homes and go in the cupboards and, their, and, and where they stored their food and took it all. And he said, we were so hungry that we did eat our dead. And his family members have stories about his family doing that very thing. Now, we don't get that. We don't understand that. But I want you to understand that we live in a world where millions of people are at that point. And I think America, we're, we're getting a little bit taste of it, right? Baby formula. Um, the stocks in the shelves. You go to Walmart now and you, there are going to be things that your favorite stuff that's not going to be there. We love corn chips. Have you tried to find corn chips? Lately, they're hard to find. But those things are not, I mean, corn chips, who, who cares, right? You're not, I'm not obviously not starving to death. That's pretty obvious. But we live in a world that does. And man, a worldwide is we're doing our small part to try to alleviate some of that among especially the children. But we work with families as well. So I want to say thank you for your support of, of me and of of Mark Reynolds, who you support, who is works with Mana, and they do he does the water drills, uh, wa water drills. He does the water wells, and if you don't think that's important, you don't know what you know. You don't understand the situation that many people are in. Their water, many times, their source of water is a little puddle that's as dark as could be, filthy. And when they drill and that water comes out clear and clean and, and it's available uh, it's available close to where they live, it is a miracle in their eyes. It's something that they have dreamed about all of their lives. And so uh, it's a great ministry. And I, I appreciate Mark and what he's trying to do and what he has done in many, many communities. Those wells become the center point of the community. And what a testimony uh, that it is. And of course, we serve a Savior who is the w water of life, right? And uh, he invites us and he invi invites the world to come and drink. And so I, I, I want to appreciate that, P tell you thank you for, for that. And this morning, we're going to try to encourage you to go further than that and 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 we're, your pastor and I are going to talk about a project that you're going to adopt, and we we're trying to we want to encourage you to make a commitment today beyond your tithes and offerings. That's priority. Don't take from from what you're giving to your church to give to missions or to give to Manna. That would be a mistake. And the reason is because. If there's not enough money to pay the light bill, guess what? There's not going to be a church, right? So that's your first priority. The second priority is your missions giving. And I want to encourage you, if you're not actively giving on a faithful, regular basis to your missions program, start. Start today. You know, it's, it's really not about how much you give. It really isn't. Really, the, the, the issue is how much is left in your budget, but it's also, are you giving? And here's what I've learned in the 63 years that I've been alive, and I've always been under the sound of the preaching of giving to missions, giving to faith promise, giving above and beyond my tithes. And, and what I've learned is that once you learn to do it and, and start doing it, it doesn't matter how much, that how much will grow. And you're not going to miss it. You're going to figure out a way to cover it. 
Now, we talk about sacrifice, and I don't know that any of us, and including myself, really understand the, uh, the, the idea, the concept of sacrifice. But there are things in our life that we could not do that cost us to be able to give to certain things. I, my sport is golf. I love to golf. If you know anything about golf, you see my head, you see a golf tan, right? Because from here on end, it's pretty light. It's because I wear a cap. So anytime you see a person like that, you go, oh, he's a golfer. I love to play golf. So in order to pay for the golf, you know what I did? I cut the cable. We don't have cable at our house. And, and, and that works with giving to your church and to, your, and to missions and to manna. What is it in your budget that you can absolutely do without? You may not want to do without, but you could in order to help some kids live. And I mean that with all sincerity. What is it? So we can all figure that out. So there's a card in your, in your chairs, and I want you to grab that card and hang on to it, if you will. And as we go through this morning, uh, just think about it and pray about it. And I, and I, and bring your attention to Mark chapter 10. We're going to look at Two events in the life of Jesus Christ that have to do with kids. And, and we're going to bring out some things. And what I want to encourage you this morning is to think about whether or not you're following Christ in these three things. Am, a, am I a true follower or disciple of Jesus Christ? Meaning, am I doing what he did? And, that, and that's what I love about the Gospels is because you, you remember the thing, what would Jesus do? And a lot of people wore the, the wrist and the shirts and the hats and all of that. Most of them had no clue as to what Jesus would do. If you want to know what Jesus would do, you've got to study the life of Christ, right? So we're going to study just a little bit of the life of Christ this morning. And, and we're going to start in, in verse 13. Mark chapter 10, verse 13. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. Now keep in mind, they did not believe that Jesus was the Son of... They didn't know who he was. All they knew was that he had a reputation and that he, in their minds, was a rabbi, a teacher. And it was, it was a privilege for, a, for the parent to have their children be blessed by a rabbi. That's what these parents are trying to do. They're trying to get their kids to Jesus, a rabbi. They did not know that he is the creator of the universe. They did not know that he is God. They didn't know any of that. They didn't believe that. But they, they knew that he was a, someone special. Um, he was, in our terminology, a rock star, right? And they wanted his signature. They wanted his, uh, his blessings on their children, but the disciples had a, another agenda. They had something else in mind for Jesus Christ. Verse 14, but when Jesus saw it, meaning he saw what was going on, he saw what the disciples were doing, he was much displeased. Another word for that it was he was angry, righteous anger. And he said unto them, Suffer, allow the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running, and kneeled to him, and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? What a great question. It's a question that everybody should ask. How can I go to heaven? How can I enter in the kingdom of God? How can I be a part of that family, of that kingdom? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. 
Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. You notice that Jesus leaves out the top ten commandments that deal with our relationship with God. He's only talking about our relationship with each other. And he says, you know these commandments. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth? Do you believe that? No. No. So right there, he shows his heart, this young man. He is, he's lying. He's not speaking truth. Now, in his mind, he may have, have done all of those, but in reality, no. And he answered and said to him, Master, all these I've observed from my youth. Then Jesus beholding him. I was looking at that this yesterday again. And that caught me. Why would, the, why would John Mark put that in there? Why would God have us to see that? Did Jesus beholding him? I mean, he's having a conversation with him. Isn't he looking at him? It's, it's beyond that. God is Jesus is looking right into his very soul. And that's what God does. See, God's not um, fooled by our outward appearance. You can fool your boss. You can fool your spouse. You can fool your kids. You can fool your parents. But you're never, ever going to fool God. Because his perspective is really, really, in fact, it's as deep as you are. And Jesus is looking at the heart of this young man. And he sees that this young man did not fulfill all of those commandments. Now, they're not very many, right? Right? I mean, there's the law of God's bigger than just the Ten Commandments, but that's really all we need to know that we are sinners in need of a Savior. He says, I behold him, but he loved him anyway. And said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come. Take up the cross and follow me. There are three things that I want to bring out about following Jesus here. First one is that Jesus loves. And we sang about it this morning. Great song set for this. Do you remember the song? Maybe some of how many of you grew up in church? Raise your hand. You grew up in church. Sing with me this song. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Now, uh, I probably didn't get you started right on the, on the key there, but uh, good job. Isn't that amazing? How many of you, it's been over 30 years since you've sung that song? Very good. You got it good. Jesus loves the little children. Now you would think that that would be something that I wouldn't need to bring up. But I think, I think we do. Because I have met church members, older church members, who really didn't want a bunch of children in the church. You know why? Children are messy. Right? They rub their hands along the wall. They mess up the bathrooms. They make noises during church services. I got a, I got a hand raise right over here. Yes, sir, I'm guilty. Son, we were all guilty at one point. How many of you ever had your ear twisted in church? Or flipped? better cut that how many of you ever been taken out of church i have and it wasn't about talking either no there was a belt involved or a paddle we carried my wife carried a wooden spoon now you get arrested for that today 
Jesus got angry at his disciples. They were hindering the children from coming to him. By the way, we can do that too. We can do that with our attitudes about kids. We can do that with our giving, where we don't want to give to where we we can make things available and make sure that the children's area is nice and bright and clean and ready to go with all that needs to be done. I know some church members that are my my family members that that belong to a church that I'm very well acquainted with, and they did a a big bang-up job, and they got upset because it messed up the decor in the church. I don't think Jesus was pleased with that attitude, to be honest with you. He certainly wasn't in this story. But Jesus also loved the the rich young ruler, the one that came to him. He loved him in spite of what he saw. And, And that's key. That's key for all of us. Amen. Even my wife and I have been married 43 years this coming June. If I got that right. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's for her. Putting up with me all those years. That's a, yes, there you go. That's a miracle. But she, she, can't, she can't see what God sees in me. And it's not pretty. And he still loves me. And he still Loves you. The greatest love there can possibly be. Because just shortly after all of this happens in Mark 10. He's going to lay down his life. For you and me. And he's going to suffer great pain. For you and me. Why? Because he loves us. And he knows what we need. And we needed that. So. We're to love as well. We're to love God and that's where tithe comes in or grace giving. I don't care what you call it. Doesn't matter. But folks, and and I know this is an old cliche, but you can't, you can't love without giving. Now you can give without loving. We do it all the time, especially nowadays. Every time you go to the pump, you're not loving. Yeah. So, but you can't love someone without giving something to them. Your time, your attention, gifts, doesn't matter. And you can't say this morning, God, I love you, but I'm not going to give to your work. I'm not going to give to your church. I'm not going to give to your mission around the world. I'm not going to do that. We show God's uh, love, God's work by giving to missions, and we love the poor, and that's where Manor Worldwide comes in for you as a church. Saying, God, I, I want to, I want to express love to those who are less fortunate than me. I'm going to miss skip the next slides, guys of the of the family, if you don't mind. The second thing is J- Jesus blessed. Jesus blesses them. And that's what the parents were looking for. And this entails loving on them by touching them and hugging them. And and all of that was very appropriate. We have to be careful today, don't we, with these terms. And that's unfortunate. But he blessed them. The creator of the universe reaches out and hugs and touches and blesses these children. In that one instance... Jesus elevates the status of children. And at that time, in that community, in that culture, children were just above a dog. It's true. And then came women, and then came men. Now, that wasn't God's plan. But that's the way man developed it. They were elevated. Children, especially children who are abused, underfed, sick, are important to Jesus. He calls them the least among us in Luke chapter 6. Now how did Jesus bless the children? He blessed them by touching them. A tender, compassionate touch. 
I, I remember many times in our, we had two programs, two feeding centers, and my wife ran them and, and, and loved on those kids. And we would be there, and these kids would come in, the, the plate of food would be on the, on the table, and you knew that they were hungry. But the first thing they did was they would go to my wife and give her a hug. They wanted that love more than they wanted the food at that moment. That always stood out in my mind. He blessed them by praying for them. He blessed them with His presence. Access. Let them, let them come to me. I want them to be around me. And it's important that we bring our children into the presence of God. And of course, God's just not here. He's everywhere. But in your home, when you have devotions, or you're just sitting around the table, or, the, or in the living room talking, hey, bring Jesus into the equation. Let your children be with Jesus. It's important. Now, how do we follow that? Well, we have to be careful. But a touch of compassion is a blessing. Our prayers for them, bringing God's blessings on them. Our presence, being around them. You know, sometimes kids, parents, they just want you to be there. They don't necessarily want you to play with them. They just want to want to know that you're there. And you're paying attention when they're talking to them, to you. And of course, the greatest blessing of all was the sacrifice that Jesus made for all of us. The third thing is that Jesus provides. Verse 21, Then Jesus beholding him loved and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. Now if you didn't know any other scripture, you would think, well that's the way to get saved. No, that's not what he's talking about. Giving to the poor is not going to get you to heaven. There's a couple of words here that Jesus tells him to do. First of all, he says, go. This is a chance to repent. Number two, sell. Get rid of what controls you. This is materialism, and man, does that control us. we We are very materialistic. It's hard for us to let go of our stuff. Yeah, it's always funny to me in my neighborhood, and it happens probably in every neighborhood in America, but we have $50,000 cars sitting outside the garage because the garage is full of $5,000 worth of junk. Can I get an amen? Thank you. There you go. Sorry about that, buddy. Um, we we just... This this young man wanted the kingdom, but he didn't want it enough. And God knew that. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew what was keeping him from the kingdom, and it was his stuff. Now, let me ask you a question. And the older I get, the better I answer this question. Is your stuff more important Than eternal life. If it came down to making that choice. Keep my stuff. Or go to heaven forever. Now. I don't want to put all of this on you. And I I, I say this often. Probably said it last time I was here. When I'm finished, I don't want you to feel guilty about your stuff. Praise God for it. I've got stuff, right? God's blessed you. Good. The other thing is, I do want you to leave here grateful. Understanding that it is coming from God. All good things come from above. The other thing is, I want us to learn, and I'm learning still, to learn to be generous. When we have the ability to be generous, let's be generous. Let's live a life of generosity. And it's more than just money. But money is a representation of our generosity. Can you honestly say that you are a generous person? That's the question. 
And believers in Jesus Christ should follow his example. And his example is generosity. Amen. He died on a cross so that we could have eternal life. But more than that, that is an abundant life. It's not just an escape from hell. It's the wonders of heaven that we don't have the mind to understand yet. So he says, go, sell, and give to the poor. Not just to anyone. Give to the poor. Salvation does not come from giving to the poor. Salvation comes from changing loyalties. This man was loyal to his wealth, to himself. He was self-righteous. We are, as Jesus said in this story, he says, the kingdom is made up of children. What does he mean? He means that that's the way we come to him. We come to him as little children with great faith and nothing in our hands. Poor in spirit. We have nothing to offer. We take up the cross. That represents a life of sacrifice and giving. It's representation of a life that, that is living for other people, not ourselves. And sometimes people that we may ne never meet, but we, we give. We, we do it. Now, look with me as I'm finished. Verse 24, and the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, he's talking to the disciples, he's calling them kids, children. How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished, out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? And of course, Jesus knows what they're thinking. And Jesus looking upon them saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. But with God all things are possible. If there's someone in your life that you're praying for to get saved, I want to tell you that with God all things are possible. If God's calling you to do something that's outside of your comfort zone, and you know it's God speaking to you, surrender to that call and understand with God, nothing is impossible. And this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something that you may think is not possible. And that is to take this commitment card and commit above and beyond your ties, above and beyond what you're giving to missions. Don't, don't take from Peter to give to Paul and say, you know what, I'm going to do this. It costs us about a dollar a day to feed a kid. That's the average anywhere in the world. That's what the average is. A dollar a day. That's not much. Now I know, I know, because I, I pay the same prices at the grocery store. Well, my wife does. I pay the same prices at the gas station. I have to deal with the economy like you do. I know where things are. And maybe some of you are going, Gary, you're asking us to do this now? The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. In actuality, probably all of us could probably give a dollar a day, the adults, maybe even some of you young people. You could figure it out. So maybe God's speaking to you about doing more than that. By faith, by faith, going, I don't know where it's coming from, but I'm going to give it and God, I'm going to trust God in my life. I'm going to figure it out. But I think we all can figure out at least a dollar a day. And I'm going to ask you to pray about that and to think about that and see what God will do in your life. As you consider someone else, kids that 
don't belong to you. You probably will never meet. But you're helping feed them so they can survive. And because we work with churches and missionaries and national pastors, it's not just about the food. It's, there's always a gospel message in this. And bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. About 70% of the children that we work with around the world come to know Christ as their Savior. About 60% of their parents do so too. It works. And we're asking you to do a little extra. And with God, it's possible. Would you bow your heads, please? I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to give you a moment to think about this and to take a pen and a piece of paper. And I'm going to ask you to fill it out and make a commitment today, right now. And then I'm going to have you stand and I'm going to ask you to bring those cards, even if they're empty, even if you're not going to fill it out. Maybe you're just going to pray and you're going to put your name in there and you're going to say, you know what, I'll pray. That's okay. Bring them to the platform here and lay them down and pray for manna worldwide. Pray for Brother Mark and myself and for the manna team and for the kids and the families that manna reaches out to the missionaries and national pastors that we work with, our partners. And just spend a moment in prayer. You don't have to kneel. You can stand. You can do whatever. I'm going to ask you to do that. I'm going to pray first, and then I'm going to give you a moment just to think about it and to fill that card out. And please, please, make a commitment today at least to pray, but perhaps even to give. Father, I thank you that you love us. In spite of us, in spite of our true nature that no one else can see, but you do. And that you bless us, and we are blessed. You've blessed this church with this facility. I'm so grateful for that. What a beautiful place to worship you and to come and serve you and serve others and serve the community. We thank you, Lord, that you provide and that you're using us to provide for others who can't for themselves. Children who are literally starving to death now have food on a regular basis, good food to eat. But not only that, they're also hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're knowing the touch and the blessings of Jesus through our missionaries and our national pastors. So I pray for this church that they will make a commitment today as a body and for each individual family that they'll make a commitment as a family to give whatever you've laid upon their hearts to give. We'll connect them with a project and they'll fall in love with those kids. And Lord, I just I ask that you'll just bless this time in Christ's name. Would you take a moment and fill out that card and then as you do, would you just come and lay it down on the platform anywhere and spend a little time praying for that? We've got pens that are being passed out right now. Um, I want to say that Pastor and I will be talking, and I, I, what I would like to do, uh, with your permission, is I would like you to, I would like to take you with me to Zambia. Uh, last, uh, after I was with you, I was able to go to Zambia and take a trip there and had a blast. It was just a, a lot of fun. We have a school there and we are taking on additional schools that are connected. Some of these schools are out in the bush. I mean, they are as rough as you can possibly get. But these kids need to be educated. But more than that, they need to hear the gospel. And so we're in that process of trying to raise funds for that, and we'll talk about that. But I would love to take you sometime in 2023. It's an expensive trip. It's going to be around $3,000. It's going to take 9 to 11 days. It's, it's a day there and a day back. It's a wonderful time in an airplane. I mean, it's a blast to be in an airplane for 14 hours. Oh man, you, I mean, if you've never been in an airplane that long, you have missed something in your life. Everybody ought to do that. Everybody ought to experience 
a 25 to 30 hour trip going somewhere. I'm telling you. But uh, it's well worth it's well worth the time. Uh, and so uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that and discussing that. I know some of you were going to Honduras. Uh, and that's great, too. Mark's a great guy. I love what he does uh, in uh, Central America. And uh, we'll try to get him to Africa because we have to dig wells as well. But again, thank you very much. Would you stand, please? And would you bring your cards to the platform and lay them there and maybe spend some time in prayer? And I'm going to turn the rest of the service over to the pastor. But thank you and God bless you. Would you would you do that as we we just spend a moment? And consider what God wants us to do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Hey, hey. All right. Challenging message, amen. So, amen. Hey, Brother Gary, come on over here. We're going to pray for him, and we're going to pray for the children and that, 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 that they feed and that the work of men worldwide. Something I was convicted about this past month was just when you see in the book of Acts, the ministry of the disciples was just like the ministry of Jesus, and it was word and deed, word and deed. Preach, but back it up with good works. To, to show, to be a platform for reaching people, because it's hard to share the gospel with someone who's starving. So too many denominations that are liberal, all they do is feed the poor, but they don't share the gospel at all. And then many of us who have been in the conservative side of things, we've been known for preaching the gospel, but not doing much on the good deeds. We need to strike the balance. So Father, we thank you so much for the work of Man of Worldwide and for Gary Phillips and his wife. And Lord, we just pray that you would just use them as the hands and feet of Christ and help us to give them the money to be able to do what they do. Lord, help us to think outside of this building. Help us to think not only around the corner, but around the world and to share the resources, not only in, of tangible means, but of the spiritual means with others who lack it. Uh, Lord, this world is, they talk such a good game of being generous and thinking about the poor, but in reality, there's so much selfishness on this planet, and, and so many times millions are given to the poor and they never reach it. They're just stolen by corrupt governments. So, Lord, we need to use tools like manna and others like them to get the resources in the hands of these people as well as the gospel. And we ask for the, all this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, you may be seated. We are going to do um, question and answer. So if you want to uh, text in a question here, uh, in just a second, we can do that. Um, first question we have here this morning is, um, can someone be a Christian and believe in evolution at the same time? That's a, that's a great question. And uh, I'm going to let you answer that as well. <laughs> oh, thank I'll, you. I'll answer if you want to. If you want to answer, you can. Okay. Um, so the difficult answer is yes. Yeah. Okay. You... To be saved, you have to believe in the literal death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as your only hope of salvation, that he took your sins on the cross and you confess him as Lord and Savior, okay? That if you believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you confess with your mouth, you will be saved, Romans 10, 9, and 10. Now, here's the difficult thing is though, so you, if you, maybe you believe that God took six days, which are really six eons and all those things, which none of that adds up, Okay. Um, when you see the, the Hebrew word yom in the Old Testament, it is always about a 24-hour day. Always, always, always. And that's why Moses goes even extra lengths to say the evening and the morning were the first day. He's, he didn't just say day, day, day. He kept telling you, sunrise, sunset, sunrise. Hebrews did the days backwards. They, they started with the end of the day. But anyway, the evening and the morning were the first day. He said that over and over and over again to be redundant on purpose, let you know these were literal six, uh, I mean, 24 hour days, six 24 hour days. The big problem with theistic evolution, which is the belief that God superintended and he was in charge of evolution and he used that as a tool to bring out his creation, is where was the fall? If, if we evolved from monkeys, which monkey was named Adam and when did he sin? 
And when did he rebel against God? And if the whole Garden of Eden is just a metaphor, how do you justify that both Jesus and Paul thought Adam was a literal person? And even Paul says that by one man, sin entered into the world and death passed upon all. And then Jesus is the second Adam. If the first Adam is literal, what, you, is Jesus not a metaphor? So that's the problem with evolution. And here's, uh, Jesus said something amazing. He says, wisdom is justified by its children. Wh when you want to know if something is wise or not, look what it produces. And we've had theistic evolution around for about 80 years now to where you see generations of churches that embrace theistic evolution. They say, oh yeah, we still believe the gospel. We just believe that Genesis, the first three chapters, and the first six chapters together are just a metaphor. What always happens to those churches is the next generation doesn't believe the gospel. Think about that. And when they, as soon as they embrace theistic evolution, their kids are like, well, mom and dad didn't believe in little Adam and Eve, so we don't really believe in a little resurrection. And guess what? They become a liberal church, no longer preaching the gospel. Wisdom is justified by children. So churches that believe in a literal Six days creation usually runs hand in glove with believing in a literal gospel. So if you want to give the opposing view, you can. No, no, no. I would just say that uh, there's a reason why Genesis 1 is in, gen in, the, in the beginning. Um, and if you struggle with the beginning, you're going to struggle with the rest of it too. If you don't get that right, it's so key. And, and a lot of people don't, oh, you know, it doesn't really matter. It matters. First of all, you don't believe your God can do that? then your God is not my God. Because my God is quite capable of speaking and things happening within a time period. So you get that wrong, you know, as Pastor said, everything else is, you're, you're going to struggle because it is, it's really foundational. Yeah, good. Um, also, uh, here's another question. It says, what, what significance did a cross have to the disciples prior to the crucifixion? When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, what did that mean to the disciples? And you can go first, Roger. <laughs> it's up to you. Well, I, the, of course, the cross was um, something that the Romans used uh, to, to, kill, to kill criminals. Um, and that's interesting because Jesus is a Jew. It, were, it was the Jews who were calling for his death. Uh, but the Bible tells us in, in, in the Old Testament that cursed is the man who hangs on a tree, right? So that's the reason why the Jews stone people. Well, Jesus took on the curse of our sin, and it was on a cross, um, and so, but they understood that it was, it was a sacrifice. It was, it meant death. You're, you're, you're taking that cross to your death is, is how I. Yeah, that's exactly. Um, Jesus wasn't the first person to be crucified. Right. So they saw crucifixions right. often. And to them, what Jesus was saying is you need to die. Jesus right. was saying to them, you need to die to yourself. You need in to fact, he says that in John. He talks about that, that, that the, kernel, the, the kernel of corn dies when you plant it, it dies. And then from there, hundreds of kernels come from that. Yes. And he says, he that loses his life for my sake shall right. find it. And he that finds his life shall lose it. So in other words, are you willing to take up your cross, die to yourself? And that's what being a Christian is. And in American Christianity, we Christian, being born again is just a, a fire insurance policy. <laughs> I just don't want to go to hell, so I'll pray this prayer, and boom, I'm like, and now I live my life however I want. That is not true Christianity. Right. True Christianity is you take up your cross, and you say, I, I, no longer what Gary wants, I will do what Jesus wants. And at the moment you give your life to Christ in, in exchange for his life for yours, you're born again. But it's not that, you know, I prayed this prayer, and I'm going to do whatever I want. You no, know, it, it is submitting to the Lordship of Christ, and you can't separate the two. Um, uh, there was another comment here. Um, this is, and this is very true too. There's a great documentary that you and your kids should watch. It's uh, on evolution called Expelled. Uh, Expelled, the subtitle, No Intelligence Allowed. And it's not written by Christians. It's, it's written by people, who, uh, scientists who embrace um, um, intelligent design. I, I kept wanting to say artificial intelligence. Intelligence <laughs> design. Uh, that's, that's, that's Musk. That, um, that's, 
Elon Musk that believes in in the AI. So <laughs> right, yeah. So <laughs> intelligent design, which a lot of Christians are having a hard time with intelligent design because they think it opens the door for theistic evolution, and, and it does. But what it does, it opens the door for all thought, and yeah. that's what we want. We want the schools have basically said no. We can only teach one thing. Don't teach anything else, and that's not the way. In fact, the um, the original court case in 1908 that opened up the door for evolution was that, that evolution and creation could be taught. And we they won the court case so that they could say, we just want equal footing. And now what they've done is say, no, no, we don't want equal footing. We, you guys won't even be allowed to talk anymore. And that that's what's really the worst thing about the last few years in America is there's no conversation anymore. It's and, our way and no way. I mean, you can't, don't even talk. Ah, no, no, no. no, you can't even talk about you know, gender transitioning. No, no, no. Shh. This is the way it is. You're a hater. You're a bigot. You're a racist. You're a homophobe. It's just name calling, name calling, name calling. There's no room for conversations. Like, hey, can't we just talk? No, no, no. We we have your kids. We will teach our kid your kids what we're going to want to teach them. No room for creation, intelligent design. It's totally been kicked out of the classroom. And that's again, non-Christian scientists. With this, the video is called "Expelled." Are saying, wait, can we at least talk about how do, how did all this happen? You're saying without a creator, it doesn't make any sense. So whether you believe in theistic evolution or not. Let me just say something, too. Don't allow them to put you in a category of you're ignorant. You're not a scientist. You're, you, you don't have all those little letters behind your name. The Bible does not disagree with true science. Amen. It, 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 there's not a contradiction. And in fact, the Bible uh, spoke scientific things long before science ever figured it out. For instance, life is in the blood. You know what they used to do? George Washington died because they bled him. Somebody was sick, they would bleed them. Why? Because the scientists did not understand that life is in the blood. The Bible did, though. Old Testament. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. All right, well, let's stand and, and be dismissed. Brother Carl, would you come on up here for us? We're going to have you dismiss us in prayer. Would you do that? Sure. Would you pray, dismiss us in prayer, please? Sure. There you go. Sure, sure, sure. Praise God. Well, glory to God. It's a good day. How do I know? Because it's a day that the Lord hath made. And he didn't stop. He said we could rejoice and be glad in it. Now rejoice means return to joy. You know, do a little ha, 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 ha. Praise God. You got to admire the young children because they're full of what? Joy. That's what it is. And joy of the Lord is my strength. That's the key. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and let's praise God. Father in heaven, we thank you today. For your love and your kindness, we thank you for the word that will not return void, but it will deliver those things which hurry and we will have believed and received from you. Thank you, Father, for your blessings that follow each and every one as we leave this house today. We thank you for the word. Hallelujah. We thank you for our, our guest Hallelujah, we pray that the blessings will fall upon him and follow him all the way in all the days of his life. Thank you for the church. Thank you for the pastor. God bless each and every one that's here this morning in the sound of my voice. And we be careful then to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So be it. Amen.